We are now on lesson 15 in our study of the truth shall set you free. Uh, the outlines that we're going through were prepared from this manual written by Gordon Olson entitled The Truth Shall Set You Free that represented uh, 30 years of biblical research, 30 hours a week. I mean, very, very diligent man. And it's been a blessing to go through this. So this is our final lesson. It's entitled, Our Participation in God's Activities. In this course so far, uh, we've seen the nature and character of God, the nature of man, what sin is, what redemption is, uh, the victorious Christian life. And, and so we, we, we've seen how the provision that God has made for us as children and sons, daughters of the Most High God now the question is, how do we share this with the world? How do we go forth from here and do the work of God? So our participation in God's activities. In other words, we have the privilege of joining God with what he is doing in this world. Our proof text to begin with, the Paul said, we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. 2 Corinthians 5.20, he said, we beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. Reconciliation is to adjust our difference. So he's speaking uh, to, to sinners, be reconciled to God. And we saw that reconciliation... It's simply to, for man to be rejoined to God, to begin living a life, the life that he designed us to live, where we are motivated by love uh, for God and for our fellow man. Amen. And Paul Amen. said, be reconciled to God. You know, you're, you're sinners, but now you need to be rejoined. That was his heart. I wrote, Acts 1.8 says, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost part of the world. You shall be. So that was not optional. It was, and we witness by our words and our conduct. Mm -hmm. You know, so witnessing is not just the preacher in the pulpit. Uh -huh. uh, mm -hmm. it, and conduct is more powerful witness than the words. Uh -huh. and, and if the conduct is not there, the words won't be believed anyway. Right. And, and, yes. and the message is the message of the power of the cross to transform human character. See, and that message can be shared without speaking a word. See, the, the power of the cross to transform human character and turn a sinner into a saint. See, that's the power of the, the cross, and that is the gospel. And, and hopefully God will open doors of opportunity where we can explain it more fully, but people need to see it first, you know, and then that creates a hunger. You know, I want what you have. You know, what? what's your secret? You know, how can you be so happy when, mm -hmm. you know, all this is going on and around you? So the Lord viewed the winning of one soul as such great, of such great value that all the possessions in the world could not balance it. So he said, what what will it profit you if you gain the whole world, yet lose your own soul? Mm. Mm -hmm. And so in the mind of God, uh, the value of one soul far exceeds, you know, anything in this world. That's how he valued souls. Mm -hmm. And he wants to bring us to the place where we also love souls and value them. So God's great effort is that all men should be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, the only way we can have divine fellowship 
is if we join God in this great effort. Because if, if that's God's heart, to seek and save the lost, and he's doing everything he possibly can for the salvation of souls, and we're not, how can we say that we have fellowship with him? Mm-hmm. You know, because we're just doing our own thing, and his thing mm-hmm. is uh, to seek and to save that which is lost. And so if we're truly having fellowship with Almighty God, he's going to put it in our heart to do what is in the thing that's on his heart the most. You know, he's going to, if we truly have that fellowship with him, he'll impress upon us that this is what I'm about. And if you're going to have fellowship with me, if we're going to walk together, that's, that's what I'm about. That's what I'm doing. I'm seeking and saving that which is lost. All who are owned by God are his ambassadors. We do not give God our time. He owns our time. And we must speak God's message in God's way. So our first point is, what are the members of the Godhead seeking to accomplish? What is God uh, seeking to do in this world? A, it was no in no sense, God's will that sin should have ever entered the world. It was man's rebellion. It was not what God wanted. Some people would disagree with that. Um, They would say, well, we would never know the grace and mercy of God, you know, except man had sinned, and there's a grain of truth in that. But it was not his desire. It was not his will. He would have shown us in some other way it, sin is never the will of God. It is always going against the will of God. He expressed his will to Adam and Eve. You're free to eat the fruit of every tree, just this one. Uh, because he wanted a heart of obedience. And so it's not his will. and never is his will that men uh, violate the law of love. Acts 17.24 God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwells not in temples made with hands. Yes. And then verse uh, 28, Acts 17.28 For in him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Amen. In Matthew 6.10. 6.10. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Yeah, so in that petition, we're praying that God's will would be done on earth. And that petition wouldn't be there if, in fact, God's will was being done on the earth. Because the prayer is, Lord, I pray that thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven, the angels are obeying him perfectly. But his will is not generally being done on earth. Because it's his will that none perish, but all should come to repentance. And yet the vast majority are unrepentant. So his will is that none should be lost, but that all should be saved. B, it is God's objective that everyone should come to the knowledge of the truth and be saved. And enter into that relationship for which we are designed. Uh, And God has no elected favorites. The gospel is for all. Mark 16, 15 and 16. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be damned. Mm -hmm. Again, it's up to the individual's will. But we're to go and and preach the gospel to present the truth so that they can intelligently make that decision. John 3.17 John 
<clears throat> for God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world should be saved through him. You know, his desire is, is the salvation of all souls. 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. And I've got the all circled in my Bible uh, because that, that's the heart of God. He, he does not want any to be lost. And he's made that provision on the cross uh, for all. What he did for there, he, he does for the entire human race. See, salvation in the sacred atonement of Christ has been provided for all universally, as we have said. And Hebrews 2.9 is one of those verses that affirms that. Hebrews 2.9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For all men, or every man. First uh, Timothy 2, 5, and 6. <clears throat> for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So all, you know, we see this over and over again, many witnesses, that what he did on the cross, he did for all. And he has several points here, five points, that speaking of the cross, it upholds God's kingdom by showing the nature of sin, and it's just due of eternal punishment, and provides a restraint against sin. So it shows, shows the terribleness of sin when we look at the cross and see that the remedy was that God himself, in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, had to come down and suffer that gruesome death, you know, that there's no other way. You know, so it's a, a revelation of the heart of God, how much he hates sin, how much he loves us by willing to provide a substitute on our behalf. Mm -hmm. And so, so it does many things and provides a restraint against sin. Because when we realize the pain that our sin brought to God, it leads us to a determination of heart that I'm done with it. No more. Mm -hmm. So it does that. That's the first point. Secondly, it shows God's hatred for sin and how it broke his heart. Three, it furnishes a, hum, a moral force to humble man's pride so that God can bless him because he resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. Mm -hmm. And you cannot, Charles Finney put it this way. Um, I forget the exact quote now, but, but the idea is that if, that if you can stand at the foot of cross, the cross and, you know, just, just see him and understand that he died for you. And if that does not break your heart and humble you down, he said, your case is hopeless. Mm -hmm. See, it's the greatest force of humility ever d devised. Yes. You know, when we Crucifixion. perceive that it should have been me. Mm -hmm. But he loved me so much, he was willing to go through what he went through, that I would not have to go to hell. See, if that doesn't humble a person, the case is hopeless, according to Finney. So it furnishes a moral force to humble man's pride, so that God can bless him, because he resists the proud. Mm -hmm. His grace is extended to the humble. <coughs> It provides the means for man's complete transformation. And how is that? The means for the transformation is just the realization 
that our sin has caused him so much pain, I'm done with it. See, that's, that's the means. It's a moral means. He doesn't just flip a switch in the inside and say, you know, you're now you're holy. It's a moral means. It humbles us and implants within our mind and understanding of the pain that we cause God. And when that conception is there, then something happens in the heart where you say, I'm done. Never again. By the grace of God, by his help, I'm finished. Mm -hmm. So again, it provides that moral, the means for man's complete transformation. Five, all man has to do is repent from all of his sin and seek the face of God in humbleness and faith for forgiveness and spiritual restoration. So that's what the cross accomplishes. D. It is man's will in response to God's loving approach of mercy that determines his salvation. God will never coerce the sanctity of man's moral freedom in regards to salvation. God is God. He can temporarily set aside man's free will in what we call providential government. But when it comes to our salvation, we're free. And he will not violate the sanctity of our free will. So he's not going to coerce. He's not going to hit us over the head with a club and drag us kicking and screaming into his kingdom. It always has to be our voluntary capitulation at the foot of the cross and embracing him. And we have Isaiah 1, 19 and 20. Uh, if you consent and obey, you'll eat the best of the land. <clears throat> you fruit, refuse and rebel, you devour by the sword. Truly, the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. And so again, an appeal to the will. If you consent and obey, if you refuse and rebel. Ezekiel 18, 30 through 32, it's the same type of message. Therefore... I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his ways, saith the Lord God. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby ye have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? And so that very clearly shows man's agency. Um, make for yourself a new heart. Uh, put away your transgressions. You know, that's repentance. And we know Revelation 3.20, that he stands and knocks at our heart's door, and we are the one that opened the door from the inside. Maybe you've seen that famous painting that shows Christ standing at the door and knocking, and there's, there's no door or knob on the outside. The door has to be opened from the inside to, to allow Christ to come in. And so it's man's will in response to God's loving approach that determines his salvation. Now our point two in our outlines, how is a person brought to repentance and salvation? What agencies are involved? And we say that there are three agents. And they all use the same, what's he call it, three agents. Uh, they all use the same uh, means, which is the word of God. And Charles Finney had another good illustration of this. The, the agents involved in the salvation of the soul, that there are three agents involved in the salvation of a soul. And his illustration is, uh, you have a person uh, on their vacation, they're at Niagara Falls, sitting on one of the park benches, you know, and here a guy comes walking along, deeply ingrained in his newspaper, <laughs> walking right toward the edge of the falls, and, you know, and 
you're sitting there in the chair just watching him and thinking that at any second he's going to see what he's doing. Uh, but he keeps on walking, you know, so the guy on the park bench, you know, when he sees him about to step over the edge, I'll say, stop! You know, and the guy twirls around, you know, starts crawling away from the edge of the <laughs> the precipice. And he said, uh, he, he said, you know, thank God, thank God, you know, that you saved my life. You know, one more step and I would have perished. And then he turns to the man, you saved my life. You know, one more step and it would have been all over for me. You know, then he says, man, if I hadn't turned when I did, I'd be dead. And so the, the person is ascribing his salvation to, to uh, three agents. You know, thank God, you know, you saved me. If I hadn't have turned when I did. Yes. And then he said, the word, the word is still ringing in my ears. Stop, you know, that, see, and it was the word saved me. So all of these three agents uh, in the salvation of soul use the word of God. It's the word that saves us. But all... But there are three agents involved in the salvation of the soul. Uh, God, of course, who takes the initiative, the soul winner, or the, you know, that shares the word and says, stop, <laughs> you're on your way to hell. You know, your next step is going to bring you down in perdition. And the person himself who's ill, yeah, you know, the person himself that repents, and all three agents use the word of God. So we'll verify that. A, the Holy Spirit as the delegated agent of the Godhead takes the initiative in salvation and in the transformation of the whole personality of the repentant sinner through the application of the atoning sacrifice of Christ and the gift of his energizing presence, the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit of God enlightens every man to his moral obligation. John 1, 9. Mm. This is the Gospel of John. John 1, 9. That was the true light, which lights every man that comes into the world. Yes, the, the life of Christ enlightens us as to what type of life is is right and proper. It's a life motivated by love for God, love for a fellow man. Uh, the Holy Spirit seeks to restrain every man from sin. 1 Thessalonians 5.19 5.19 Quench not the Spirit. Mm -hmm. So we're not to quench his convicting activity, but open our hearts and receive it. Uh, the Holy Spirit exerts powerful convictions of guilt. John 16, 8 through 11. 8 through 11. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and ye see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so that's the work of the Holy Spirit. And see, a person could not be saved without his agency. And so he is doing what he can to bring that, that conviction Another thing he does in point four is to manifest the moving love of God through the gospel. John 12, 32. 32. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Yes, there's a very strange and wonderful drawing power uh, to the cross when, it is, when he is lifted up and presented to the hearts of people. 
and the cross is what he uses to draw people to himself. Uh, the Holy Spirit seeks to persuade all men to renounce sin and to be saved. Isaiah 1.18 Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So he's always trying to persuade men. We know the Revelation 3.20. He's just gently knocking. He says, hey, you know, I've got something so much better for you. Would you please allow me to come in and do some house cleaning and you know, set things in order? And, but we have to open that door. But he's there. You know, just please let me into your life. And so he's, that's our point. God takes the initiative. And he's right there. Oh, you know, I have such a better life for you. Will you please open the door? Uh, the Holy Spirit is the one who washes, cleanses, sanctifies the whole inner being of man. Acts 15.9. 15.9. Uh, 15, and put no difference between us and them purifying their hearts by faith. Amen. Mm. Titus 3.5 talks about the, the washing of the Holy Spirit, you know, the renewing, the renovating. He has saved us, not by works of righteousness that we have done, but by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Point seven. He makes purified, repentant sinners become partakers of, of the divine nature through the gift of his intimate indwelling presence. 1 John 3, 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remains in him, hmm. and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. Hmm. It's not that he's lost his ability, but when his heart mm -hmm. is... Filled with love for God and love for fellow man, his actions are going to be right. Mm -hmm. See, there might be emotions fluttering, but emotions are not under the control of the will. But if the heart is right, the actions will be right. That's why the Bible says to the pure, all things are pure. To the defiled, those who live lives of selfishness, all things are unclean and defiled. And so he purifies the heart. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we have Ephesians 4.23. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Yes. Okay, point B. Okay, we looked at the agency of God in our salvation. He provided the cross. The Holy Spirit is just working with everyone who is open at all. You know, it's not his will that any should be lost. Now, point B, God's servants. That's you and I. As free moral agents must make choice to exert similar persuasion. And we have a vital, active part in turning men from disobedience to obe obedience, and in their transformation to walk in newness of life. So our first point is that God's fellow servants, we must live a loving, sacrificial life, manifesting the compassion of Christ. Matthew 20, 25 through 28. <clears throat> But Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And so Christianity introduces the upside-down kingdom. 
that the greatest is the servant of all. And that was our Lord who humbled himself to serve others. Where the philosophy of the world is the others. Want to serve self. You know, that, that's the desire of the world. It's the me first. Mm-hmm. Where the kingdom is others first. And in the greatest of all is the servant of all. And so the greatest servant of all, of course, was our Lord Jesus mm-hmm. Christ, who left heaven, came to the Lord to serve us mm-hmm. in the sense of providing the atonement, providing the means for our complete transformation. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 14 and 15. Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours, but you. Mm. For the children Mm. ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. Isn't that a beautiful passage? Mm-hmm. Paul says, I, I, I'm not coming for yours, your things. You know, I'm not coming to preach to you so that I can, you know, get a nice offering. I, I'm coming to give myself to you. You know, I love you. I, You know, so that's really the heart of a servant. And so that's our point here, that God's fellow workers m- must live a sacrificial life uh, to reach out and do what we can to help others. Mm. Two, uh, there must be a faithful witness of the revealed truth of God and the gospel. John 20, verse 21. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. Yes, so we are to have the same mission as he did. Now, we don't make atonement for the sins of the world, yet he does want us to live a crucified life. You know, that we are dead to the things of the world, alive to the things of God. So Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. No longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, in the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So we must be faithful witnesses. Second Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So that's our obligation, and that's what we're doing uh, today. You know, to prepare ourselves. And that was the admonition that we are to, you know, equip ourselves to be a blessing. Three, uh, we must engage wholeheartedly and urgently in Holy Spirit anointed persuasion, and yet with the kindness, the love and kindness of Christ as representing God. Acts 4 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. See, what a powerful testimony. You know, they don't have their seminary degrees, but, you know, they could tell they've been with Jesus because he talks. They talk like him. They act like him. You know, and that was very persuasive to them. Hmm. Point four, a man must labor with great persistency in a spiritual travail of prayer. So this is what we can do. Prayer is also our part. For God's special guidance and visitation about specific individuals, in the process of salvation, since Jesus said, For apart from me, you can do nothing. 
So there's that seeking after God for his anointing, his power, and his guidance, as well as praying for specific souls that he would lay upon our heart. John 15, 5. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. Mm. For without me, ye can do nothing. Mm -hmm. Acts 10, 34 through 35. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that fears him and works righteousness is accepted with him. Yeah, no respect of persons. And again, this goes back to the importance of prayer. Because we're, we're saying that prayer is one thing that we as an agent of God can do. God's doing everything within his power. And there's something that we can do, and that is pray for specific souls. That God would enlighten their mind, that he would bring that conviction, that he might open the doors for them. And because God is not a respecter of persons, he treats everyone with disinterested benevolence. That means he has no favors. When you pray, that gives God an independent reason why he can do more on behalf of one mm -hmm. than he could otherwise do. Mm -hmm. And still not be a respecter of persons. Mm -hmm. So if the enemy comes and says, hey, why are you doing more for this one? You're not doing that for this one. And he'll take the devil by the scruff of his neck and <coughs> take him to a prayer closet somewhere <laughs> and show them somebody on their knees fervently interceding for somebody else. And this is why. Wow. This mm -hmm. is why I'm not a respecter of persons. Mm -hmm. I'd do the same thing for anybody else who would pray that fervently. Mm -hmm. See, so this is what we're talking about. We have an agency. We're, we're the ones sitting yes. on the park bench saying, stop. Mm -hmm. And our prayers... Um, Touch the heart of God. He is not a respecter of persons. That his love is, as I said, just interested benevolence. That doesn't mean he doesn't care. It's disinterested means, you know, impartial. It's another word for impartiality. He's impartial. But when we pray for someone, Amen. that gives him an independent reason wow. why he can do more for that one uh, than he could otherwise do. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. That's another reason to pray for safety when you travel. Yes. Wow. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. That allows God a reason to intervene in your situation. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you know, he had intervened in every situation. But when you when you pray specifically, yes. Lord, I claim Psalm 91 over this trip. That those <laughs> yes. who abide under the shadow of the Almighty yes. are going to protect me. See, and, and now now God can do more for you mm -hmm. than he can for others, and he's still not a respecter of persons. Because mm -hmm. as I said, he'll take the devil by the scruff of the mm -hmm. neck. Look, look at this prayer. He appealed to me. That's why I can do more. Yes. And I would do the yes. same for anybody else that they will pray. Amen. Hallelujah. So is that kind of connected to that you, you have not because you ask not? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Good job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And some people say, well, all we can do is pray for him. We get I say, hey, we get to pray for yes. him. Yes. <laughs> yes. And I know very well that God has spared my life, you know, many times on the mission field uh, oh, because yeah. of prayer. Okay. Either my own or maybe somebody else's mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. prayed on our behalf. Mm -hmm. You know, Tim talked about the time this huge block came off you know came untethered from a truck and we were right behind it and, yeah. and it was just coming our way and our mm -hmm. driver just reacted you know so quickly and <laughs> the guy the poor guy behind oh. us the water, <laughs> oh. that got it. Oh my. and so wow. prayer mm -hmm. uh, romans 2 11 also speaking of the impartiality of god 
For there is no respect of persons with God. Okay. Point C. The subject as a moral being is able to resist all measures that can be taken towards his salvation and must of his own free will respond to the truth break down his heart before God, and turn from all those that sin. We're talking about the three agents involved. We're on point C. The three agents involved. Now this is the responsibility of the sinner. He must turn his, from all known sin, coming to Christ in a total commitment of faith to participate in his own transformation of heart and life as the Holy Spirit illumines his mind and the life and suffering of Christ. So in that process, man must no longer suppress the truth and unrighteousness, which according to Romans 1.8, he has been doing. Is it 1.8? Yeah. 1.18. 1.18, I'm sorry, thank you. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Yeah, so hold the truth is, hold it back, it's suppressed. Push it away. See, if he's going to be saved, he has to stop doing that. And allow the truth to, to come to his heart. Two, Jesus stands and knocks at the admission, for admission to his heart. And so man must hear his voice and open the door. And we know Revelation 3.20 standing there. Mm -hmm. But the subject's part, uh, that moral agent must, of his own free will, open the door. Three, man must come to God in faith and believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him, which is Hebrews 11.6. Four, man must repent, a result of a complete change of mind. Uh, regarding truth and turn from darkness to light, from the domain of Satan to God. So repentance, he has to do that. Turn. Like that man who was just about ready to step over the cliff. Yes. You know, he had to turn to be saved. <laughs> Four, five. The subject must believe the gospel or exercise complete trust in the atoning work of his Savior for their forgiveness of his past sin. Now point D, the truth is used as the instrument. So we got three agents, you know, God, the soul winner, and the sinner, and they all use the same instrument, which is the word of God. So the truth is used as an instrument by both the Holy Spirit and God's fellow workers in the process of moral enlightenment and persuasion and provides the means through which the repentant sinner is purified and quickened to a newness of life. It's through the word of God. Uh, Luke 24, 44 through 47. 44 through 47. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Mm -hmm. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it is behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And so, ye are witnesses of these things. So he opened their minds to understand the scripture. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and he does that to, to those that begin to turn their hearts. You know, their minds are open. They're, they're no longer suppressing it, pushing it away. You know, they have to receive the word of God. 
Romans 6, 17, and 18. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. So they obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine or teaching the word of God that was delivered to them. They heard it, they understood it, they obeyed it. So that, but it's the word of God uh, that brings that conviction. James 1, 18 and 21. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Yes, yeah, so he begat us, or we are born again, you know, through the word of truth. That was the instrument mm -hmm. that, you know, awakened us, stopped us, elicited the response, just like the man on the park bench yelling, stop, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, was was the instrument uh, that was used to cause the man to turn, mm -hmm. you know. It, but it was the word. He responded to it. Mm -hmm. If he hadn't responded to the word, he would have perished. Mm -hmm. And so it is right. uh, with the sinner. Uh, 21 of James, we have that, please. James one twenty one. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness, and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. Mm. The word which is able to save your soul. Mm -hmm. You know, stop. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's what saved that man from walking over Ni the cliff Niagara Falls. The word which is able to save your soul. So that's the instrument. Uh, 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23. Seeing ye you, you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, yeah. being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. So two times in that passage, it speaks of the, the Word of God being the instrument that brings about salvation in obedience mm -hmm. to the Word. Now we come to our third heading. What has been God's manner of approach in seeking to turn men from sin to a warm-hearted, divine relationship? And in essence... It's just simply this. It's the truth, the R U, the H, truth, uh, presented to the mind of man so that with his will he can make a choice either to obey or disobey. And so we have some scriptures that will verify that. Point A, God explained to Moses the reasons for the floods. Uh, Genesis 6, 5 through 7, we've read that many times, where he looked down, he saw the rebellious of men, he was grieved into his heart, and he said, I'm going to destroy the earth uh, because of what you have done. Yeah, but Moses or Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And, and he said, the, the, the wickedness has come before me. He's grieved. And he was brokenhearted. And so he explained. You see, God, God always deals with man with, with truth mm -hmm. to the mind. Uh, in the case of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, God also... Uh, dealt with man. Genesis 18, 17 through 19. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, 
and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord, to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. And in the rest of the chapter from 23 on, um, he reasons with Abraham, and Abraham reasons with God. Will thou indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous people. Mm -hmm. You know, and then he bargains down to 45, 40, mm -hmm. all the way down to 10. And, and so God's approach is he's, he's reasonable, and he, he addresses truth to the mind. He couldn't even find 10. You know, and Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. See, God reasoned with Moses in his call to deliver Israel. Exodus 3, verse 7. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Yes. And then... Exodus 4, 1 through 9. Then Moses answered and said, What if they will not believe me or listen to what I say? For they may say, The Lord has not appeared to you. And the Lord said to him, What's that in your hand? He said, A staff. Throw it to the ground. So he threw it to the ground and it became a serpent. Moses fled from it. But the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand and grasp it by its tail. So he stretched it out, out his hand, and caught it, and became a staff in his hand. That you may believe that the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. And the Lord furthermore said to him, Now put your hand into your bosom. So he put his hand into his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, the hand was leprous like snow. Then he said, Put your hand in your bosom again. So he put his hand in his bosom. When he took it out, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. And so here again, the approach was to reason with man. You know, he's dealing with us. He's a reasonable God. And that's his approach to man, is truth addressed to the mind. Moses reasoned with God over the golden calf rebellion. We've gone over that two or three different times. Just that wonderful scene on the mountaintop where it wasn't wonderful in God's eyes, but it's a poignant, it's, it's a wonderful example of intercession where God said to Moses, step back, you're going to destroy these, this people. I'll make a new nation of you. And Moses pled before Almighty God and reasoned with him. Mm -hmm. You know, what mm -hmm. are the Egyptians going to say? What are these other nations going to say if you do that? What about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? You made a covenant with them. Reconsider. And, you know, there was this reasoning process going on. And it says the Lord repented. He changed his mind about the harm that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Mm -hmm. So, that's God's approach to man. He, he, it's truth addressed to our minds. It's not, you know, it's not the emotional appeals, it's truth to our minds. Samuel reasoned with the nation of Israel about a king. And just to paraphrase that, he said, you know, if you guys choose a king, he's going to tax you. Mm -hmm. He's going to take your daughters to, you know, be his domestic helpers. He's going to draft your young men, put them in the army. Uh, you know, don't do it. Uh, but they insisted upon it anyway. F. King Hezekiah reasoned with God and was healed. And I, again, I know you know these stories. Um, Isaiah said, set your house in order, you're going to die and not live. And he turned to the wall and prayed. 
And before Isaiah could get out of the outer court, the word of the Lord came to him again and said, Isaiah, go back and tell the king that I have heard your prayer, I've seen your tears. Behold, I'll add 15 years to your life. And so it's his prayer where Hezekiah interceded with God, and it had that effect. And so God is very reasonable, and he, he deals with, um, you know, wanting us to understand him. G, God desires to reason with man about his sinful rebellion. And we've read the Isaiah 118, come, let's reason together about this. Or your sins be as scarlet, they can be as white as snow. So they're red as crimson right now, they can be as wool. If you consent and obey, you'll eat the best of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you'll be devoured by the sword. But what's it going to be? That's his approach. You know, to try to open our eyes. You can eat the best of the land. It's up to you. If you refuse and rebel... There's, there's going to be a consequence. Let's reason this thing out. H, God beckoned to Israel to give reasons for their disobedience. Isaiah 41, 21. Produce your cause, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong reason, <laughs> saith the king of Jacob. <laughs> Yeah, it's like you're in the courtroom situation. You know, defend yourself. <laughs> and of course, there's no defense. Yeah. There's never a defense uh, for sin. God invites an examination of the situation in Isaiah 43, 22 through 26. Uh, 43? 43, 22 through 26. Okay, 22. But thou hast not called upon me, O Jacob, but thou hast been weary of me, O Israel. Thou hast not brought me the small kettle of thy burnt offerings, neither hast thou honored me with thy sacrifices. I have not caused thee to serve with an offering, nor wearied thee with incense. Thou hast bought me no sweet cane with money, neither hast thou filled me with the fat of thy sacrifices, but thou hast made me to serve with thy sins. Thou hast wearied me with thine iniquities. I, even I, am he that blots out the transgressions for mine own sake, and will not remember thy sins. Put me in remembrance, let us plead together, Declare thou that thou mayest be justified. Again, God is saying, let's, let's reason this thing out. And again, his approach is truth to the mind of man. Okay, God seeks to lift man's thoughts. I'm sorry, I skipped one. God reasons with mankind to evaluate their lives in Isaiah 55, 1 through 3. Ho, oh, everyone that thirsts, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore, do ye spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfies not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear and come unto me. Hear, and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. What a beautiful passage. Mm -hmm. You know, why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? Why do you labor for that which does not satisfy? Hearken diligently to me. Eat what is good. Delight your soul in fatness. Come to me. Eat the bread of life. You know, why do you, you know, live... You know, apart from me, and that's that's a haunting question that's come down through through all of time. Why? Mm -hmm. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? Why are you going your own selfish, independent way when I have such a feast for you? I have a, 
abundant life for you. And, and you're just throwing it away. Why? See, so again, truth to the mind. Mm -hmm. Not force. Not that I've chosen mm -hmm. you before the foundation of the world that you're going to be one of the elect. Everybody else I'm damning to hell. No, his approach is, why do you spend, why are you living that way? I have so much for you. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? Hearken diligently to me. Eat what is good. Delight your soul in fatness. The abundant life. Okay, God seeks to lift men's thoughts to the level of his. Isaiah 55, 6 through 9. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, mm -hmm. and my thoughts than your thoughts. Mm -hmm. So, so he says, seek him where he may be found. Call upon him. Because his, his thoughts are higher than theirs because they're living in total and open rebellion against God. He says, my ways are higher than your ways because you're going your own selfish, independent way. See, what he desires is that his thoughts would become our thoughts. Our thoughts would become his, his thoughts. thoughts. And that our ways would become his ways. And his ways would become our ways. See, he's speaking to the backslidden nation. Mm. But so many people use that out of context and say, well, you know, his thoughts are so great, you know, that there's, you know, we'll never approach the thoughts of God. That's his approach. He mm -hmm. wants to share his thoughts with us. Mm -hmm. But he can't while we're still in our rebellion. Mm -hmm. uh, he says to them, my ways are higher than your ways. Because they were walking their own independent yes. way come and weren't willing to submit to him. And God's saying, come up here. <laughs> I have so much more for you. Mm -hmm. L, God pleads to Jeremiah that his people might return to obedience. Jeremiah 2, 1 through 5. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying... Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou went after me in the wilderness, in a land that was not sown. Israel was holiness unto the Lord, and the firstfruits of his increase. All that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come them, saith the Lord. Shall come upon them, saith the Lord. Hear ye the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, What iniquity have your fathers found in me, that they are gone far from me, and have walked after vanity, and are become vain? Yes, this is God's reasoning with them. You know, what did he find in me? Why did you not give your life to me? You know, you're walking in vanity. You know, you're vain. Come back. So that's God's approach. Mm -hmm. You know, reasoning with the mind of man, trying to get us to face reality of our situation. Yeah, God pled that Judah would listen and turn from their sins in Jeremiah 26, 2 through 7. Two through seven. Thus, thus saith the Lord, Stand in the court of the Lord's house, and speak unto all the cities of Judah, which come to worship in the Lord's house, all the words that I command thee to speak unto them. Diminish not a word. Mm. If so, if so be, they will hearken and turn every man from his evil way, that I may repent me of the evil, 
which I, which I purpose to do unto mm. them because of the evil of their doings. Mm. And thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, If ye will not hearken to me to walk in my law, which I have set before you, to hearken to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I sent unto you, both rising up early and sending them, but ye have not hearkened. Then will I make this house like Shiloh, and will make this city a curse to all the nations of the earth. Mm -hmm. So the priests and the prophets and all the people heard Jeremiah speaking these words in the house of the Lord. Now, is it, now it came to pass, when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking, all that the Lord had commanded him to speak unto all the people, that the priests and the prophets and all the people took him, saying, Thou shalt surely die. <laughs> Yeah. So, so, so here, you know, he's speaking the truth of God, you know, and he's speaking the word of the Lord. And in my version, verse three, it says, perhaps they'll listen, you know, and, and turn from their wicked ways. And so he presents the word of the Lord, but they wanted to kill the messenger. <laughs> but see, that's God's approach. He's bringing truth to them. And, and. He says, if you don't obey God, you're going to be punished. You know, there's going to be great calamity to the nation. And they, you know, they, with their minds, they said, no way, I'm, we're not going to listen to God. And they try to kill the messenger. But God's approach is, uh, speak this word to them, verse 3, perhaps they'll listen. Wow. Uh, 20, God, des I'm sorry, God desires man to know his process of thought, you know, what he's, how he thinks. Jeremiah 29, 10 through 14. For... For thus saith the Lord, that after seventy years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think uh -huh. toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts mm -hmm. of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Mm. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places, whither I have driven you, saith the Lord, and I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. Yeah, so here again is an illustration that God speaking truth to the minds. He said, you know, mm -hmm. seek me with all of your heart. You seek me, you'll find me. You know, and I'll, I'll do, I'll bless you. I'll, you know, but it's up to man. But this is God's approach. You know, not force, not coercion of any kind. It's just, you know, you have to make up your mind. But he brings truth to the mind. He said, I have plans for you. To give you hope and a latter end, I'll, I'll bless you. But it's conditioned on, on man's response. Uh, God pleads with man to think with him upon their differences. Micah 3, 1 through 3. Six. So Mi Micah 6. six. I'm sorry. One th yes, one th 6, 1 through 3. 6, 1 through 3. Hear ye now what the Lord saith, Arise, contend thou before the mountains, and let the hills hear thy voice. Mm -hmm. Hear ye, O mountains, the Lord's controversy, and ye strong foundations of the earth. For the Lord hath a controversy with his people, mm -hmm. and he will plead with Israel. Mm -hmm. O my people, what have I done unto thee, and wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To me, that's a powerful passage, and in my mind mm -hmm. comes up a, a court scene, and you've got your witnesses, the mountains and hills, they've, they've
they've seen everything that's gone on and God says, I've, I've got a controversy. I have a case with you. Uh, how have I worried you? You know, what have I done? Uh, testify against me if you can. And see, he's saying, you don't have any excuse. <laughs> that's the bottom line. <laughs> you have no excuse. You know, you have witnesses of my goodness to you, how I have blessed you, how I have brought you out of slavery, how I delivered you from the Babylonian captivity, you know, and yet you go to other gods. I want to know why. Yeah, so again, truth to the mind. Will you obey? It's up to you. But that's his appeal to man. P. Jesus, the world's greatest teacher, sought to get man to think over their lives and relationships to God and to each other so they could live blessed lives as God intended them to live. Um, Luke 4, 31 and 32. And came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. Hmm. Amen. So again, the appeal of truth to the mind. That was his approach. Uh, John seven forty six. The officers answered, Never man spake like this man. Hmm. In eight... John 8, 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Amen. And the Holy Spirit continued this, this penetrating teaching you know, to the heart of man. John 15, 26. I think that there's a mistake in your notes. 1526. 1526. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. Amen. Point R, the Apostle Paul expressed confidence in God to do likewise, that God would use him and uh, continue to speak to people. Romans 8.32 He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Yes. And the all things is, is not just possessions and safety, but it's truth. He'll, mm -hmm. he'll enlighten us and give us that truth so that we can be persuasive when we share with others. S, the Bible is an intelligent communication to mankind. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 13. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. Hmm. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. Yeah, so the Holy Spirit uh, makes real the written word. Since he's the author in the first place, you know, he helps us to understand its, its true meaning. T. God's word is designed to bring a, a full understanding of ourselves. Hebrews 4, 12, and 13. That's the one that says the word of God is quick and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing mm -hmm. to the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, and the discerner of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So it's the word of God that, that cuts us and gives that understanding. And of course, God has revealed uh, the future course of this world, which ends in his second coming and judgment. And, and we, we studied the book of Revelation. We know that. Point four. 
What was the approach of the apostles and the servants of Christ in the New Testament, and particularly the Apostle Paul? What was their approach? Well, on the day of Pentecost, the apostles spoke with great intelligence uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit, Acts 2, 4 through 11. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia in Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Hallelujah. You know, so God filled them with the Spirit, and there they were speaking uh, in language not known to them, but it was known to the, to the people that were listening. And, you know, it impressed them that they were speaking of the mighty works of God. You know, and they were cut to their quick, and... Many of them repented. Point B, Peter and John reasoned with the people, and about 5,000 were converted in Acts 4, verses 2 and 4. 2. Being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. 4. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. So there are two reactions to the truth. In verse 2, uh, the temple guards, the Sadducees and the priests, Pharisees, they were greatly disturbed. You know, it really bothered them. The truth bothers them uh, because they were speaking of Jesus and the resurrection. But to the open hearted, you know, they received it gladly and 3,000 were saved or 5,000. Peter and the other apostles continued in this persuasive teaching in Acts 5. 19 and 20. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. So God released him by the angel and he said, This is what I want you to do. Go and speak the truth. Go to the temple. Tell them, you know, what Christ has done. Whether they obey or disobey, that's going to be up to them. But I want you, Peter, to go in the temple and preach the gospel. So again, that's that's the Lord's approach. Uh, the dis- uh, do we have twenty five there as well? Acts, uh, but someone mm-hmm. came and reported to them, mm-hmm. saying, "Behold, the man you put in prison, he's standing in the temple teaching the people. <laughs> scandal of scandals, and bringing truth to them." Amen. Okay, the disputers of Stephen resorted to violence. Why? Because they couldn't. They couldn't contend with the truth that they heard. Uh, Acts six five. And then 10. 5. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Farmanus, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. 10. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Hallelujah, the wisdom and the spirit. They couldn't resist it. Again, it's it's addressed to their minds. uh, Acts 7, 54 through 56. 
When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. <laughs> but he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Amen. And so there's a, there's a reaction to truth. For the humble, they, they accept it. You know, they're cut to the quick. Uh, but to to the opposers, when they can, when they can uh, logically resist the truth, you know, they 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 can come up with a truth. They resort to violence. You know that that's the answer. You know, they can't confront intellectual. They can't win the intellectual argument. So they say, well, let's kill the messenger. We don't like what we don't like this truth. Mm -hmm. Let's if we we can't reason against him. Mm -hmm. You know our arguments don't stand against his. <laughs> uh, so let's kill him. <laughs> That'll solve our problems. But it didn't. You know because it, it there was a prick in the heart of the apostle Paul who was an apostle at that time. He was consenting to his death, but he will never forget what he saw there. And it deeply affected him. And later on, when he was converted, he said, man, I'm, I'm the chief of sinners for what I did. Persecuted the church. Mm -hmm. You know, and he saw, to his horror, you know, the life that he lived in his past. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we, let's see where we at here. Mm -hmm. Uh, Philip and the Ethiopian uh, it's, it's quite a lengthy passage but we know the story uh, God took Philip uh, to meet the Ethiopian eunuch he was driving along in his chariot mm -hmm. and um, you know they greeted each other and the Ethiopian was reading the scroll from Isaiah and do you understand it? He said, no, unless somebody teaches mm -hmm. me. And so he began where he was at in Isaiah 53. And from there, spoke Christ. And then the man believed and mm -hmm. baptized. And he went on his way rejoicing. Mm -hmm. But the, re the approach was um, a revelation of the truth of the word of God mm -hmm. applied mm -hmm. to the mind and heart of the Ethiopian eunuch, and then he obeyed, he responded to the word of God, he was wide open, went on his way rejoicing, and he went to Ethiopia, and the church was then there from him, you know, he planted the church in Ethiopia, Christianity's been there for 2,000 years. Amen. They even have some unique churches. You've probably seen that that were that are just carved out of solid rock, you know, downward. And those those are ch built shortly after the wow. Ethiopian eunuch got back to to Ethiopia. And that's quite a drive <coughs> when you think about it. <laughs> you know, that's a long ways. <laughs> I've been to Abbas, Ababa. Ethiopia and spend a night, a couple nights there. And beautiful country. Oh. But it's a long drive by chariot. <laughs> <Cheerio. laughs> you know, and he may have taken a boat for part of his passage, mm -hmm. you know, because they're not too far from the ocean. He could have taken a boat up to, you know, the end of the Red Sea there and taken, oh. taken that route. I don't know. I got yeah. there. It's immaterial. Uh, Paul, let me see, um, F, God commands all men to repent, and a change always results. And Paul's cry to the Romans in 9 was, my heart's desire, my cry is that Israel would be saved. He said, I could wish myself a curse, you know, if it would result in the salvation of Israel. And so he reasoned with them. Uh, Paul was reasoning in the synagogues on repentance. Acts 17. 
Uh, let's go first, 17, 2 through 4. 17, 2 through 4. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. Mm. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. Yes, again, there's, there's the, controvers the truth is accepted one of two ways, either accept it or you fight against it. Mm -hmm. And uh, lewd men of the baser sort. <laughs> <laughs> I like the way the King James put that. That, that phrase now belongs to me. <laughs> okay, we have the Acts 17, 16, and 17. Now, when Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within as he was beholding the city full of idols. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. So again, that was his, his manner of approach. And then when God opened up the door in uh, 22 through 33, you know, he said, that which you worship in ignorance, mm -hmm. you know, this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. And so he told them the, that statue to an unknown God. No, he's the real God is the one who made the heavens and the earth, mm -hmm. preached truth to their minds. And mm -hmm. some believed, some didn't. They said, we'll, we'll hear from you again on yeah. this yeah. issue, you know, he, he piqued their curiosity. But again, truth to the mind is the approach. Okay. I, Paul, was reasoning in the synagogue, persuading both Jews and Greeks in Acts 18, 4 and 5. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timothy were come from Macedonia... Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen. J, Paul was reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God in Acts 19, 8 through 10. 19, 8 through 10. And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when diverse were but when diverse were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them, and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. And this continued by the space of two years, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Now, to me, th this is uh, just a miraculous situation. Ephesus is, was at the crossroads of the world. It was a trading center. So people from Africa would come there. People from Europe would bring their goods. People from Asia would bring their silks. And from India, their spices. And they'd come to Ephesus and they would trade. So Paul's there. This is Paul. He's preaching the gospel. And he's kicked out of the synagogue after a period of time. So he takes the interested people to a Bible school like this, sits down with them. This is Paul. This is, you know, these guys that are from all over the world. You know, they're there for a period of time. Their interest is captivated. And he, he spends just a short period of time with them. 
because they're busy guys. They got to go home. They got families. They got to take their treasures that they got from Ephesus mm -hmm. from trading their silks and you know take their stuff back to the other nations to their home. So they don't have a lot of time. But he takes them aside to the school of Tyrannus, teaches them the basic principles of the kingdom of God. You know, and they go back home. So this guy, you know, he's African. He comes back and he shares with them. And this guy goes to India and mm -hmm. shares with, mm -hmm. with his acquaintances. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this guy goes back to China, Japan. They said within the space of all, in the space of two years, and this is what blows me away, all Asia heard the word of God, both Jews and Greeks. One Bible school. <laughs> all Asia heard the word of God. See, this, this is the power of, you know, a short-term Bible school. Yeah. yeah. To reach mm -hmm. multitudes mm -hmm. quickly. <clears throat> and Paul just taught... Mm -hmm. A few, you know, and I'm sure it was rotating, you know, mm -hmm. during that period of time. He, he taught for a period of two years. And it says, and all Asia heard the word of God. That mm -hmm. just blows me away. Mm -hmm. But I can see why. Absolutely. He taught faithful men. Second mm -hmm. Timothy 2.2. 2, taught faithful men. Were able to teach others also. They embraced the truth. Mm -hmm. They went back. You know, they traded their spices from the gold of Africa and went back, shared with their family. These guys shared. Mm -hmm. These guys over here, you know, they, they're they sharing with their group. And once they learn, you know, it just, yeah. it just multiplies, spiders out. And the Bible does say there, it, mm. in the space of two years, all Asia. Mm. And that might be a little bit of hyperbole. There might be a few that hadn't heard, but yeah. the, it's basically saying it, went out. it, it just went out exactly. tremendously. All Asia mm. heard the word of God. And, and so this is God's approach, I, I believe. He yeah. said, go make disciples of the nations, teaching them mm -hmm. to observe all I've commanded you. So it's not just going and building orphanages. It's, yeah. <laughs> you know, right. that's good. It's right. wonderful to build orphanages and hospitals and schools mm -hmm. and, you know, try to uplift the people. But what they need is the gospel. Mm -hmm. yes. And to be discipled to where they learn to live victorious Christian lives. And that's mm -hmm. what Paul, in essence, taught them at Ephesus. Is that all Asia heard the word of God? It's very encouraging. It is very encouraging. A little leaven in the loaf. But would that work in our generation? And I share this to the working. I share this to the, to the glory of God. We went to Rwanda. You know that nation that was just absolutely devastated by a genocide in 1994. Just a million people killed by machetes, oh. primarily. You know, blood running oh. down through the through the rivers. I spelled it wrong. I have a hard time talking and writing at the same time. I've just kind of one track mind, so thank you that you love me anyway. <laughs> but we went to Rwanda, and I'd have to look on my record to see what year it was. I'm thinking around 214. So we went to Rwanda. We had a, a little Bible school in a place that was, you know, just dirt floor, mud brick situation. 10, 12 people there, very poor, um, just ordinary folk, and uh, we taught them, and we had a problem with the leadership. Uh, the person who invited us uh, proved to be unfaithful. Then the second host 
uh, that we worked with for a couple of years. He proved to be unfaithful and you know, struggled for a period of time, went back again, held another Bible school, but then it started to, to branch out. And so from Rwanda, we went to Burundi, you know, and, and held a school down there uh, because people from here knew people down there and were networked and went to Burundi. A um, guy from this school was a French teacher in Rwanda, which was a French-speaking nation. Mm. You know, they have their own indigenous language, but French was their trade language, and they changed to English. Mm. So with services were not needed anymore, so that I'm, I'm gonna, he felt led to take uh, the word of God to Congo. The DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo. And so he met a group of 10 bishops who had underneath them hundreds of churches, and they approached him and said, You know, we would like you to teach us this Bible school, but we don't want our pastors to come. We want it just for us bishops. You know, because they didn't want to admit their pastors. They didn't know everything. So he said, okay. So he taught 10 bishops, and through them, hundreds of churches, thousands of individuals, you know, are receiving the truth. And this one man from Rwanda's trade had, I don't know, seven, eight schools that he's done by himself from beginning to end uh, and reached a lot of people in the Congo. Uh, there was a visiting, a visiting uh, apostle, that's his title, I guess, from Kenya that visited his friend in Burundi. And he sat down for three days under our teacher, Francis Asante, who was teaching end times from Revelation. You know, it's, Never heard anything like that before. Convinced of the truth, he said, "Would you bring that back to Kenya? You know, could could this school come to Kenya?" And he called me, and I said, "Yes, we can do that by God's grace." And so the school spread to Kenya, uh, to a place near the um, near Lake Victoria, this large lake They're up here. Then from there, it spread to Nairobi. Which is a very big, big city. And this Kenyan host had a friend of his, a, a, a man that he had trained, a spiritual son who was a bishop, but was also with the Kenyan uh, CPU, the police force, the anti-terrorist police. And he said, could you have, bring a school to our compound? I said, of course we can. <laughs> you know, so God, see, all, all the while, God is training teachers, mm -hmm. you know, from, from these various schools that are going out. Mm -hmm. So within a very short time, you know, we're in several nations here, and then Uganda. He says, you know, please come up here and help us. You know, now um, Malawi. Now up here, South Sudan. Then over here, uh, Tan Tanzania. Dar es Salaam. Mm. You know, so within a very short period of time, from two to fourteen, you know, starting with class like this, mm -hmm. you know, reaching. <laughs> you know, several, six, seven uh, nations uh, within within <laughs> that part of Africa. Meanwhile, stuff is going on in West Africa, many nations up there, you know, and expanding like this. And so, so I'm, I know by experience that this, what Paul did in, in Ephesus is duplicatable. Mm -hmm. 
Hallelujah. Look at all yes. those sparklers. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. And so to me, this this miraculous is wonderful. Yes, it is. And, and so I challenge the people because we read this verse and I said, you know, if in Asia, two, you know, all Asia is reached by one Bible school. Why not all of Africa, oh. you know, through what mm -hmm. you guys are doing, you know, and try to plant that vision in their mind. That this can happen. That God use ordinary people. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to be a Saint Paul. It's mm -hmm. just ordinary people that that have the truth. Now share it mm -hmm. and walk through the next open door uh, that God has for you. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Yes. And and so, yeah, it's highly effective. And for our particular ministry, I'll, I'll just spend another minute or two here. We see our approach as being threefold. Number one is the Bible school itself. We see how that's been very effective, and you've experienced that in your own life, that, mm -hmm. that it is mm -hmm. absolutely life-changing. Mm -hmm. And we see that as the first step in a three-step process. The second you know, in the process, I mean obedience to the Great Commission, which is to go into all the world, mm -hmm. make disciples of all the nations, teaching them mm -hmm. to observe all that he has commanded us. And so I see the Bible school as step one in that process. Mm -hmm. You know, and the command was don't go into all the world, build hospitals, build orphanages. Mm -hmm. You know, and that is fine. Yeah. Is fine. It's, it, it's a wonderful thing mm -hmm. for missionaries to do that, but that was not his command. Mm -hmm. It's to make disciples. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know that yes. that should be an outflow. Yes. Mm -hmm. But not yes. the main focus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and those things will happen. So the first step, the the Bible school, to really equip us. The second step that I see is in the discipleship making process is when those who have sat through the Bible school have an opportunity to share with others what they've learned in the Bible school. Mm -hmm. Because it's one thing to, to sit in the chair and, you know, absorb the information, but it's another thing when God calls upon you to share it with others. Mm -hmm. So at that point, the Holy Spirit is your mentor. Mm -hmm. And you grow tremendously. And so if any of you have ever taught in your past life, you know that when you have to teach a topic, that's when you really yeah. master it. Mm -hmm. Because questions will come up that you don't have the answers to, and it drives you to your knees, it drives you back to the Scripture, and say, Lord, you know, what's the answer? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and so I see that as part of the discipleship-making process. But then mm -hmm. your mentor is now the Holy Spirit, not the missionary. Yes. And, and so I see in our particular ministry um, to provide opportunities through all these subsequent schools uh, mm -hmm. for teachers to rise up and mm -hmm. express their gifts. And, and that's when they really blossom and really begin to grow. Then the third thing that I see um, is the networking of mm. teachers, you know, that have gone through the school. Now they've become teachers. Mm -hmm. Now they're going cross-culturally mm. to different nations. Mm -hmm. You know, next week I've, I've got to get a ticket for a guy here to go to South Sudan. So he's going to go to South Sudan for the first time. And it's going to be a life-changing experience for him. Mm -hmm. But he's going to develop relationships with the spiritual leaders mm -hmm. of South Sudan. So now you've got a network on the, on the leadership level of the spiritual leaders of the nations that know each other, that love each other, mm -hmm. that have the same vision, the same goal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and now, you know, we can really begin to get things done. And at that point, two witness ministries, we just stand back and let 
God do what he wants yeah. to do because, you know, this guy will say, will you, will you come up here and do a marriage seminar for my church? Yes. You know, will you come over here and teach me, you know, this, that, or the other thing? You know, mm -hmm. come and, and do a crusade for me. See, and these things are happening, mm -hmm. and and we are totally out of the picture, <laughs> which I'm so happy about. <laughs> but God is just doing the work. Mm -hmm. But yet, as is through these the this networking on the on the spiritual leadership level of the cross culture, where you know you you've got tribes that have formerly been at war and enemies with each other. Wow. Now the teachers mm -hmm. coming and staying in their house. Mm -hmm. And, and wow. barriers of prejudice are being broken down. Because mm -hmm. the Kenyans, yes. for example, uh, are prejudiced against the Nigerians. Mm -hmm. Because I'll admit there are a lot of scams <laughs> <laughs> that come out of Nigeria. Yes. You know, so that's, that's in their mind. Mm -hmm. and, and so... They're by and large prejudiced mm -hmm. against the brethren from Nigeria because they have seen so much shenanigans. Mm -hmm. And even in the religious realm, mm -hmm. there's so much evil going on <laughs> in the name of religion. They come and just for the offering. Yes. You know, so yeah. so they're very prejudiced. <clears throat> But yep. then when they come and, and stay in their home yeah, and sit, eat at their table and they've gone through the course, they're holy men of God, mm. it breaks down that prejudice. Mm. And to me, that that just, I am so happy to see that. You know, where these barriers that the devil has erected over uh -huh, the years, uh -huh. tribalism, racism, mm -hmm. to be broken down. No, you know, and, and it breaks down when when you live together. Yeah. You know, and, and truly become brothers and share your life with each other. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just the classroom. It's you know, let's share life. Mm -hmm. So hallelujah. That's hallelujah. what Paul did. That's yeah. what Paul did. And our so our little amazing. ministry is trying to emulate that. God is so good. <laughs> mm -hmm. We're one in Christ. We'll give God all the glory. To, That's right. We don't take one ounce of credit for what he has done. But it's marvelous. It is. And so this is God's approach. Okay, Paul told Felix of righteousness and self-control. Acts 24, 24 and 25. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, which was a Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he reasoned of, right, of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Mm. So he was almost persuaded. Exodus, Acts 26, 25. Mm. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. Yeah, he mm. said, you've almost, almost persuaded mm -hmm. me. See, he's accused of being mad, but again, the approach was truth to the mind. Truth to the mind. And now the person with his will has to decide one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Paul persuaded many from the law of Moses and from the prophets in Rome, Acts 28, 23 through 24. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him in his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. Mm. So he persuaded them from morning to evening. You know, a lot of, a lot of people could not do that. From, the Mos you know, from morning to evening. They, 20 minute sermon, that's about the limit. <laughs> <laughs> Once a week. 
once a week. <laughs> Out yeah. of a can. <laughs> Paul said for the, you know, from morning to evening. You know, it's the principles of the kingdom of God. So he's explaining God's nature and character, the nature of man, what sin mm -hmm. is, uh, repentance, faith. And he could do that from morning to evening uh, with the scripture. We have that same chapter, uh, what is it, verse 30, 28 verse 30. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him. Preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness unhindered. Preaching and teaching. Our point number five. Can we be God's fellow workers as the light of the world if we are not enthusiastic and Christ-like in motive and conduct? And the answer is no. <laughs> yeah. The word enthusiasm in itself, uh, the word theos, is <laughs> that's God, it's, it's filled with God. Enthusiasm literally mm -hmm. means that, you know, you're filled with the presence of God. You know, that it's not just jumping up and down at the ball game when your team scores. Enthusiasm means, you know, you're reflecting God in your life. So can we be the light of the world if we're not Christ-like in motive and conduct? No, we can't. Mm -hmm. A. A, a witness, to witness, is to represent something or someone with our whole personality. And the only way we can be an effective witness of our blessed Lord is if we are willing to be genuine and wholehearted in our inner lives. And so we are called to be witnesses. Uh, Gordon Olson talks about when they did the first atomic explosions, you know, back in the early 40s. I think they had an explosion out in the Nevada, Nevada desert somewhere, you know, and so they had set back bunkers, you know, three, four, five miles from the where the bomb was actually going to go off, you know, and people were in those bunkers and, you know, heavy, heavy glass and you know, just so they could see what was going on, have cameras there, you know, filming it, because they're, they're really trying to discover the power of that. And when the bomb did go off, you know, and the earth shook, he, he said a person that is sitting in there, you know, and witnessing that, you know, and just being overwhelmed, you know, by the power that he's witnessing, you know, he's the one who can be able to share, you know, what he yes. saw. You know, it, it's mm -hmm. not just reading the textbook, you know, explanation, but it's when you're there as a witness, you know, and to be confronted with that awesome power. Mm -hmm. and he said that's how it is with Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, we are witnesses to what we have seen and what we have experienced. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. And people can argue with theology, but they can't argue against a, a witness. Right. Mm -hmm. Because that this is my reality. Yes. Right. You know, and I'm just simply telling you what Christ mm -hmm. did for me. Amen. Thank you. Yes. So it's, it's to witness with our whole personality. <clears throat> B. Best to represent Christ in any true sense, we must be enthusiastic, in other words, filled with God. That's the word the, theism, the, theos, mm -hmm. to be filled with God, enthusiastic, enthusiastic. We must be enthusiastic and Christ-like in our motive and conduct. C, to be Christ-like, we must be transformed continually by the indwelling Holy Spirit in a humble walk of faith. The Christian life is not intended to be a set of regulations, but an intimate spiritual relationship with Jesus. How is God's wisdom and energy released through the servants of Christ? Well, the Lord Jesus promised the power of the Holy Spirit for those presenting the claims of God. 
The bestowment of the Holy Spirit is to be distinguished from the gifts and operations of the Holy Spirit. He wants us to be filled in the sense of being empowered. John 16, verse 7. Verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. So repentant believers are to be overwhelmed in God consciousness by this fullness of baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, and baptism, again, is overwhelming. You know, you're, you're immersed in the very presence, the Spirit of Almighty God. Two, this new relationship of power was bestowed on the day of Pentecost to the 120. And we, we studied the Holy Spirit. We know that in Acts 2, the Holy Spirit fell with great power. Mm-hmm. And it gave them the ability to, to speak the gospel with boldness. Mm-hmm. Of course, Peter had been somewhat of a coward before. Mm-hmm. He wouldn't even confess Christ. He denied him three times. Now mm-hmm. he's standing in front of the very people that crucified Christ. That you are the, his murderers. You are the one that put him to death. And um, mm-hmm. they put him to prison. They wanted to kill him. But but he had that boldness. Mm-hmm. Uh, because he witnessed with his eyes. He had experienced uh, the transformed life. Because Jesus said, when you're converted, strengthen your brethren. You know, and now the Spirit is upon him. He's converted. There's that boldness. In Acts 4, verse 8, there is another occasion after they had initially been filled with the Holy Spirit where they needed a refilling. They needed, you know, here's another opportunity for service. Uh, We need a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. Let's read this, Acts 4, verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people... And elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, Mm. whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. Mm And then verse 31, and when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. So the filling of the Holy Spirit was so that they could speak the truth in a way that would persuade and convince the minds of the people. Acts 6, 8 through 8 and 10. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Verse 10. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 5.18. That's the one that says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the command. Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. So be God's program now is for the spiritual church. As the, body, as the body of which Christ is the head, to be an integral operating unit <clears throat> animated by the Holy Spirit with all members contributing to its activity. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 12-27. For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we bond, we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, 
because I am not the eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body? And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much worse, those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Yes, yeah, so God's plan for man now in the New Testament is, is the church. That Christ is the head, we are the body. And the role of the church is that we would be taught, that we would be discipled, that we would be um, nurtured until we all attain to the stature of the mature Son of God. That we might be filled up with all the fullness of God. Uh, that we might know the height and depth and length and breadth of the love of God that surpasses knowledge. And so the role of the church is, is to you know, so so train us, so disciple us that we become Christ-like. That's one aspect of the role of the church. The other role is duplication. You know, repeat this process. Go and seek and to save that which is lost. Gather up as many of the lost coins as we can find. Uh, bring them in and, and repeat that process uh, to the they become Christ-like, then go into all the nations, make disciples. And, and so it's not an individual, you know, where you've got superstar Christians doing all the work. It's, it's the body of Christ, uh, and each one has a role to play. And then we see that God will give uh, spiritual gifts uh, to enable, you know, that divine enablement to do things that, that are beyond our normal capacity to do. And the spiritual gifts are to be a blessing to the church, but also, again, to equip us, uh, to form us into his image, and, and then to send us out uh, to do the work of God in the world. Number one, or point C, two important facts are revealed concerning the bestowal of the spiritual gifts. And we've gone through mm -hmm. the, Holy Spirit series, so we've dealt with this in the past, but again, let's uh, consider this. Number one, spiritual gifts are modes of operation of the Holy Spirit within and through humble servants of Christ. They're not deposits given to us as their own possession in independent use. You know, like we carry around our wallet in our back pocket, as Tim illustrated to us. Yeah. You know, that I have this gift of healing, you know, and I just can pull it out at any any particular time that I want to and use it. Well, God does give gifts of healing, but it's a manifestation that the Spirit would give through that person at a, at a particular moment in time. You know, if one had the gift of healing as his own possession, then he ought to be going down through every room in the, every hospital of the land, just oh, laying his hands on yes. people and, and emptying the hospitals. Mm -hmm. You know, that was truly a gift that was his own possession. Uh, that sh that's what he should be doing. Mm -hmm. But it's a manifestation of the Holy Spirit uh, that, that he will give. And same with the gift of faith and the other gifts. 
they're, they're not deposits that, that we think we own. No, it's the Holy Spirit will manifest that at the appropriate time and in the appropriate way. We have 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these work that one and the self-same Spirit dividing to every man severally as he will. Mm. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. Yes, so we these, these gifts are given as the Holy Spirit um, chooses in their manifestations of the Holy Spirit, you know, at the particular time that they're needed. He, he will manifest himself that way. And you might not even uh, realize it at the time. You know, he may give you a gift of discernment where you just know something about that individual. You know, just drop into your spirit. You know, that could be a manifestation of that gift. You know, so it's, it's, and it's not always in the church setting. You know, because we're only in church an hour of Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. but we live 365 days of the year, 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. And he wants to manifest these these gifts, you know, for the edification of the body, but for also the, the reaching of the lost. Mm -hmm. And so he'll, he'll give you a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge. You know, you'll intuitively know. Mm -hmm. But it's not your own intuition. It'll, it'll be a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. He, he'll reveal mm -hmm. something to you. And so be open to that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, give you a gift of faith mm -hmm. when you need it. Give you a gift of, of healing. Mm -hmm. So they're available. Mm -hmm. They're available. And as we, they're given by him. Yeah, we don't whip it up. From our own but it's a gift from God the Holy Spirit is sovereign in the gifts we just read that divides severally or individually as he wills and yet yet we're all however to cover the earnest or the best gifts and so 1st Corinthians 12 31 but covet earnestly the best gifts and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. Yes, so there's, it's certainly acceptable to pray for these spiritual gifts. Mm -hmm. And he says in 14, one, pursue love, yet earnestly desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. And again, the prophecy is uh, speaking forth the word of God. Mm -hmm. and, and again, that might be around the coffee table or the coffee shop in town, mm -hmm. you know, to have that gift of, of relating to other people and, you know, bringing, bringing in the word of God when, whenever it, it comes about. He said, pray for that, you know, yes. pray for opportunities, especially that you may prophesy, mm -hmm. but it all has to be done by love. Mm -hmm. Point D, uh, the following enumeration of spiritual gifts appear in the New Testament. So we've already read 1 Corinthians 12, and there we have nine spiritual gifts. But when you compile lists from these other chapters, you see that there's more mm -hmm. than those nine. So let's go to Ephesians 4, verse 7, and then 11 through 16. 
But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. And so you have um, God giving gifts to individuals, apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, mm -hmm. and they are gifted to with a goal. The goal is until we all come to the unity of the faith, to a mature man, till we all achieve the fullness of Christ. See, that's mm -hmm. their responsibility given to, to those people that are given that one, those, you know, any one of those wonderful gifts. Uh, we have the list in Romans 12, 4 through 8. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy, according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering. Or he that teaches, on teaching. Or he that exhorts, on exhortation. He that gives, let him do it with simplicity. He that rules, with diligence. He that shows mercy, with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. So here's another enumeration of gifts. Prophecy we've had before, but ministry, you know, that can involve a lot of different things. You know, just a hug to the grieving. Yes. Uh, ministry, teaching is, is a gift. Exhortation, some people have that gift to really exhort. That's supposed to be an X. Uh, the gift of giving is the gift that the body needs. The gift of administration. Uh, Harry Kahn said, usually a person does not have the gift of giving without another gift. And that's the gift of acquiring. <laughs> because you can't give what you don't have. <laughs> you know, so sometimes gifts gifts go together. Uh, I, that really resonated with me. That's <laughs> smart. But yet, a person can be very poor, but have the riches of heaven, yes. you know, and give the truth. And that, that's what I love about my African brethren. They don't have many material goods, but, you know, they have a lot to give. And I really learn a lot every time I go over there and, and, and fellowship with them. So that's the end of our, our uh, class here on the moral government of God. Let's seal it in prayer. Thank you. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to spend these 15 sessions just uh, digging into the Word of God that we might discover the very heart of God. And we have seen that you love with an everlasting love, and that you desire that we would walk in your ways. You desire that your thoughts would become our thoughts, and that that our ways would become your ways, and that we would walk that walkway of holiness. And Lord, thank you for equipping us. Thank you for opening our understanding that we can relate to this great God who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, and yet he dwells with those who are of a humble 
and contrite spirit and who tremble at his word. And so, Father, thank you for the work of grace that you've done in our hearts and lives during these hours. And I pray that the Holy Spirit would bring back to remembrance, our, remember, our memory, the things that we have learned during this time. And that we might put into practice, Lord, the principles of your kingdom that we have learned during these sessions. So, Father, we thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Peter.